Sport Clips presents haircut highlight reels featuring Rick. There goes Rick. He throws down for the MVP experience, gets his hairstyle, beard trimmed, and he's out. Get in line online at sportclips.com slash check-in and get your hair in the game like Rick. This is the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome into something new we're trying here, a new digital experience during the golfing season. Trey Wingo here with you. What we're going to do is we're going to do a little extra bonus podcast inside the Golik and Wingo podcast. Uh, we're going to focus in on the four majors of the year in golf and maybe do some tennis stuff as well. So we're excited about that. But obviously, we're kicking this thing off with what we're calling our Monday After the Masters podcast inside the podcast because we've just wrapped up what happened at Augusta National uh, and uh, it was quite a weekend. Look, I, I think a lot of us went into this year's Masters with heightened expectations for a bunch of reasons. Number one, because we had generational talents on display. You saw Phil Mickelson win a World Golf Championship event at the age of 47. You saw Tiger Woods in contention so many times without knocking down the door yet, but coming close at the Honda, coming close uh, at Bay Hill, and maybe we thought he could put it together and have a run at a fifth green jacket at Augusta. That didn't happen, but we did have quite the shootout between all these young guns that are sort of knocking on the door of greatness on the tour. Justin Thomas, who of course is the PGA champion and wants to be that number one in the world so bad. Dustin Johnson, who is number one in the world and of course was the prohibitive favorite going into last year's Masters when he had the slipping on the socks on the wood floor incident that hurt his back and took him out of contention before he could ever get started. Then you have Jordan Spieth, who, by the way, we, we just have to admit this now, Jordan Spieth is, should be a top three betting favorite for the next ten years at Augusta because he's either second, fifth, eleventh, or fifth every year. So we should re- have our expectations to Jordan Spieth is either going to win this thing or be in the top five every year for the next ten years because he plays it perfectly. Then you have uh, guys like Ricky Fowler, who made a late charge, and of course you have John Rahm, who was good until he was undone by putting one in the water uh, late on the back nine. And then you have the guy that won it, Patrick Reed. So, uh, listen, if nothing else, I can I think we can say with great certainty that the future of American golf in the next 10 years is going to be really, really good. Because right now, for the first time since the 03-04 lap-over seasons, Americans hold all four majors. You have Patrick Reed holding the green jacket. Justin Thomas is the owner of the Wanamaker Trophy that goes for the PGA Championship. Jordan Spieth is the owner of the Claret Jug. And, of course, Brooks Kepka just destroyed the field last year at Aaron Hills. So U.S. Open golf and United States golf is in a really good place. But what did this Masters do, and what didn't it do for us? When we come back, we'll be joined by the mouth that roared, the best hair in golf, Golf Channel's and NBC's analyst Brandel Shambly will join us on the Monday after the Masters podcast, the digital experience inside the Golik and Wingo podcast. Well, as we continue on our Monday after the Masters podcast inside the Golik and Wingo podcast, so it's really like Inception. It's a dream inside of a dream. And if we're having double <laughs> dreams, we got to have Mr. McDreamy from the golf world with us. Golf Channel's Brandel Shambly is with us. Uh, Brandon, we had you on the show, the radio show this morning, and you, you answered the question exactly the way I hoped you would when I asked you, did this Masters deliver? And you said no, despite all the hype and, and the interest on Sunday because of the two guys that weren't there. Yeah, it was a bit of a dud. You know, Tiger and Phil weren't there. They, you know, they just clearly were not, you know, in any kind of shape to compete, uh, either one of them's games. And then the Rory Patrick Reed pairing. Uh, was a bit of a dud, too. With one swing of the club, you knew that Rory McIlroy was not going to be around, not going to be at his best to challenge Patrick Reed. And Patrick Reed didn't really play his best golf. I mean, the challenges came from two, three groups back, and they came late, and then nobody ever really got in front. Nobody ever got in front of Patrick Reed. And he had all the answers when anybody did challenge him. So there's a lot to get into with that one answer. And let's let's start with Tiger and Phil. What surprised you more? That Tiger wasn't there or that Phil wasn't there? That Tiger wasn't there. Yeah. I didn't figure Phil would really factor into the thing. I mean, Phil is, came in hitting less than half the fairways, and his club head speed was 115 miles an hour, which is five, six miles an hour off what it was. Essentially, that's short and crooked. Um, short and crooked doesn't do well at Augusta National. He finished dead last in driving accuracy. That didn't surprise me. He didn't contend. That didn't surprise me. Tiger Woods, on the other hand, still got lots of pop in the bat. I figured even though he wasn't driving it straight, he'd figure out a way to get it down there. 
and he's hitting his irons. He was hitting his irons fine. He wasn't the best coming in, but he was hitting them fine enough to compete. Uh, but he hit his irons, you know, Thursday, Friday, hitting the water 12. He hit a lot of poor iron shots, wasn't anywhere close to the hole, and wasn't anywhere close to the lead. So I thought Tiger would contend, and I was not surprised that all the other scenes played out, but I was very surprised that Tiger didn't contend. Yeah, that, that really didn't compute for me, especially the way he didn't contend. To your point, I mean, the driver, which has been his biggest question mark this entire comeback, was good enough, I thought, uh, at the Masters. I mean, for God's sakes, on Friday he drove it. But wait, he hates the first hole. Let's be clear about that. The first hole and the fourth hole at Augusta, he cannot stand. Yet somehow, some way, on the first hole, T. Olive, he drove it to win 93 yards of the green, and he missed the green with a wedge. His iron play was really not there. No, it wasn't. I mean, you know, look, he did hit some good drives. You know, he had a few good drives on one, it, you know, a few good drives on 11. A few, yeah, he hit some good drives, but he hit a lot of average drives, you know, and a lot of stinky drives. You know, one day he, you know, he hooked it really quick on two and it hit the trees and rattled down. And I mean, when you're 50th in driving accuracy, which is what he was out of 53, you're not driving it well. I mean, he hit some good drives and some long drives. But he wasn't bombing it down there in the right spot. To hit short irons into greens, except for the one you were talking about. And there he just hit. I mean, it really was shocking. And he was transparent about it. He was great in the media center. I mean, he's the best I've ever seen him. And it was it was really good to see Tiger Woods healthy and back, and swinging fast and and great with the media. But uh, but no, his iron play was was far from spot on. But look, he's changing his golf swing. You know, he's trying to go for back like the to the golf time. swing he had eons ago. And it takes time for him to make changes. Well, the other thing was weird. I mean, he tied for 21st in putts at 1.62 per hole. He had 32 putts on Sunday. You know, the, the, the thing also, when he get, put himself in p- position, he couldn't make the putts at, the, at some of the birdies and the par saves, especially early in rounds that he needed. So computing that all in going forward, we have the U.S. Open at Shinnecock. We have uh, the Open Championship at Carnoustie and then the PGA Championship, which, of course, uh, will be at Bell Reeve in St. Louis. Do you like his ability to contend at any of those courses based on what we've seen in his play? Shinnecock, yes. Carnoustie depends on how they set it up. Uh, Bell Reeve, probably not. Um, they're going to have some thick rough there. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, more of a U.S. Open setup would be my guess at Bell Reeve. But uh, but Shinnecock, yeah, maybe. You know, they may set it up linksy, and you know, there may be some wispy rough. Um, which will allow him to miss the odd fairway and still compete. But he's going to have to start driving the golf ball better. I mean, he's 130th or so, something like that, in strokes being off the tee. Um, he's got he's to figure out a way to drive the golf ball better. But it's great to have him back. He'll, he'll contend. He'll, he'll, he'll compete. His world rank will go up. Uh, he may snag a victory here or there because he's putting the ball well enough and he's got plenty of speed. But for him to contend in major championships, He's going to have to drive the golf ball better. Um, in 2013, when he was player of the year, he was by far the best iron player on the tour. By far. Yeah. As a matter of fact, nobody's been better since 2010. Nobody's been better than Tiger was in 2013. But he was 127th in throw skin off the tee. So if you're bad in one area, you've got to be extraordinary in the other. Well, he's good with his iron play, but he's not extraordinary. And he's still bad off of the tee. So he's got to find some place to, to fill in the holes. All right, so we move on from the guy that didn't win to the guy that did. And when we had you on Monday morning, you said about Patrick Reed, he's a character that has a little darker side to him. Uh, and I love that about Patrick Reed. You know, As soon as I saw the pairing on Sunday between him and Rory McIlroy, all I could think of was, oh, dear God, please give us something close to what we saw Sunday in 2016 at the Ryder Cup at Hazeltine when they basically brawled without actually throwing punches at each other uh, in that match. They were screaming, they were crowds were going nuts, and it, it never really materialized. But we did see that that Patrick Reed guy who has a chip on his shoulder is good for golf in a way because he's a different kind of cat. He is. You know, we live in an era where, you know, there are, there are almost half a dozen extraordinarily talented players who are very polished, uh, telegenic say all the right things, do all the right things, got great smiles, perfect. And then you've got Patrick Reed, which, again, uh, I said this on your your show, uh, he reminds me of kind of a mix of Nick Faldo uh, and Ian Poulter, and you might even throw in a Lee Trevino 
kind of uh, blend in there. Because, look, I mean, he's got the bravado of Poulter, for sure. But he's got more the talent of Nick Faldo. But he comes from sort of a blue-collar, sort of a, a complicated background like Lee Trevino, which is great. You know, it, it, it offers hope to all those kids out there watching who just were not um, blessed in the gene pool. You know, they weren't, they weren't just born to elite parents in the upper echelons of society, a nuclear intact family with everything hunky-dory, and given everything, given every opportunity in the world. Patrick Reed was not given anything in his life. He had to take it. He had to fight for it. He's scrappy. And so, you know, do you begrudge a guy who turns out that way? No. I mean, we're all a product of our background. So it's great to see. Beyond that, beyond the bravado, if you listen to him in the media center, he did not respond with, he didn't smirk at questions. He didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't get petulant. He, he was very insightful. His demeanor was, was pleasant. You know, it w- wasn't uh, gregarious, you wouldn't say, but he was pleasant. And he was very bright. I did not know he was, I mean, I, it's not like I thought he was not bright, but I didn't know he was that bright. Uh, and he, he answered, he had tremendous insight. You know, when Patrick, when uh, Roy McIlroy was trying to push all the pressure onto him, he said, well, I am leading, which right. means he, he, he owned up to the fact that he was going to face pressure. But he didn't try to defer it away the way Roy McIlroy did, which told me a lot about the pressure that Roy was facing. Yeah, it's almost like Patrick said, come get a taste if you want this, because I feel good That's with, right. with my three-stroke lead, which I love, by the way. I did, too. Yeah, I, I did, too. And you, you know, I did. There was a lot I loved about Patrick Reed this week. You mentioned Rory. Um, that first swing on one was just atrocious. Uh, you know, when he's one of the best drivers of the golf ball there is out there. But the thing that yeah. I think was was also paramount to him and why he didn't win was look when his putting's on, he's going to shoot sixty fours like he did at Bay Hill on a Sunday a couple weeks ago to win. But his putter betrayed him a couple of times in, in that final round. Well, it did. You know, I saw him before he went out, and he was doing these drills where you flip the putter around sideways and hit the hit your putts off the toe of the putter, which is a drill I know that uh, his new putting coach, Brad Faxon, has sort of given him. And when I saw him doing that, it occurred to me that he was going, you know, full Monty with every single thing that he could think of to get himself in the right frame of mind. You know, those drills are things you sort of practice maybe before you go out to a tournament, but before you play the final round it was like shouldn't you be a little more comfortable with everything that puts you into the final group of the final round i just thought it was sort of an emergency effort to just like revisit every thought that got him there uh and you're right the swing that he made off of one was maybe the i mean i can't ever i can't think of a worse swing in a final group off a first tee that i have ever seen by any player anywhere um it was shocking and you're right he's one of the best drivers of the golf ball in the game and it uh, it set the tone for the day all right with with him out of the picture then someone else needed to step up and the two guys that did were jordan spieth and, and ricky fowler look spieth obviously is a guy by the way we should be honest about this jordan spieth should be favored to win the May, the masters for the next 10 years because he's either going to win or be <laughs> he's going to be top five every freaking year that he's there it's ridiculous um and it's been five years his worst finish is what 11th yeah, he's this just in. He's going to contend and win more green jackets. But after he yeah. made the run and tied uh, Patrick, then that tee shot on 18, I mean, look, we've all been there, but my God, we haven't been there when you have a chance to make a birdie and really put some pressure on Patrick Reed Sunday at the Masters. What happened? Well, the thing that's always hard to get your arms around with Jordan Spieth is how he does what he does when he's a relatively poor driver of the golf ball. I mean, at his best, he can shape it right to left and left to right. So that's great. You know, he's not one-dimensional. He doesn't have one sort of shape shot. But he'll hit some, you know, he doesn't hit it very far. He hits these sort of middle-of-the-road average distance. And he'll hit it kind of crooked with you. Twice this week, he hit the trees right off the tee on 18. Um, he managed to, I, yeah, he managed to save par the first time he did it. But the second time, it's, you know, it's, it's not surprising. I mean, the poorest part of his game is his driving. And his putts from seven to ten feet. So we saw it off the tee, and then he missed the eight footer for par. And really, if you're Patrick Reed, who was watching the scoreboards, he admitted as much. He was hawking them, and he was very aware that Jordan Spieth had made bogey right about when he was making birdie at uh, at fourteen. So it's great that you know 
Jordan Spieth is a great scrambler. Um, he really is. And he's maybe the best iron player in the game of golf today, especially given the fact that he's coming from further out. But, uh, but he's always going to be, um, he's always going to be a guy that, that hits the poor drive here or there or misses the, the short putt here or there. So that leaves us to the guy that did put somewhat of a pressure situation on Patrick Reed. That would be Ricky Fowler. He made the birdie on 18. And as you well know, there's a huge difference between having a two-stroke lead on the 18th tee at a, at a major or having a one-stroke lead. And Patrick did what he had to do. But what did you make of Ricky uh, and his and his round? And the fact that 14 under would have either won or put you in a playoff in every Masters ever except seven of them. Is he the most unlucky guy in the world, or is he just not doing what he needs to do to win? Because in 2014, he was the lowest to, to par through all four majors that year by a large margin and didn't win one of them. That's right. To win, though, you've got to put yourself in a position to win and then extend the lead. He'll put himself in position to lead, and then if he'll get the lead, he'll just fall back. He'll play. He'll shoot 75 or 74. So when he get when he when he gets the lead, he'll finish fourth or fifth, and then when he's fourth or fifth going into the last round, he'll make a run and finish second. So it tells you that he certainly has the game to win multiple majors. It's just that he doesn't quite have what it takes between the years right now. It's a, a lack of experience, you might say. I mean, he's twenty nine years old. You can't really call him young anymore. Um, you'd think he'd have the experience by now. It's doubt. It's, you know, uh, I don't know what it is, but there's something missing. Um, he, he plays his best golf when he's chasing. He does not play his best golf when he's leading. So I thought, you know, all, all day Sunday when I was doing our pregame shows, I was talking about Ricky Fowler because I thought he was in the perfect place to put pressure on Patrick Reed. I thought Patrick Reed would shoot 73 or higher on Sunday. I, I thought... Uh, Rory would struggle as well. Um, And I thought Ricky Fowler would make a run. He did. But the biggest surprise to me was that Patrick Reed didn't really stumble. Yeah, he he did what he had to do, shot a one under 71. Okay, He did. Before we let you go, partner, as we're looking toward the next major, U.S. Open, Shinnecock, right now if you had to put money on the table, who would you say is the guy to beat? Probably Dustin Johnson. I mean, we didn't talk much about Dustin Johnson, but he drove the ball like a god at Augusta. Um, he's, you know, he kind of crept up on that board, got up to, you know, third, fourth place at one point on Sunday, but it wasn't close enough for us to really talk about them. Uh, I think he'll, I think Shinnecock will set up beautifully for the rest of the year. It's going to be Dustin Johnson's playground, and and everybody else is just going to have to bow up. You know, they are because the rest of the year the golf course is just set up beautifully for Dustin Johnson. Well, look, as I said Sunday, Dustin Johnson doesn't walk around a course he saunters. I mean, he does, you know, great athletes move slow, right? I mean, oh, dude, he you know, moseys. They, they, he moseys at right. times. He moseys. Like, they're, you, know, they, you know that inside, everything's just working at the right. You know, the, the tachometer's not in the red at all. Yeah. It's just right where it needs to be. And, uh, and he's, got, he's got skills that – he drives the ball better than Roy McIlroy. Yeah, I mean, he does. He you does. know, Roy's got – Roy – Look, it's beautiful to watch. Rory's got this long, graceful, gorgeous golf swing. But it's it's bad in spots, you know? It it is. It really is. It he he drops it under the plane when he transitions. He kicks the right knee in quickly, which puts him way under the plane and leads to a flip. Now, he sweeps it beautifully, so he hits high draws that are, you know, jaw dropping. But it, it it exposes the toe of the club. It's gonna it's gonna cause him to hit it on the toe occasionally, which he did off one. Right. And it leads to high pull hooks, which he hits a lot with his irons, and it and it leads to inconsistent play, which is which is what you see from Roy. I mean he, he he's capable of putting himself there, but then he'll hit two, three, four shots that you're like, Where did that come from? And it's because of his golf swing. He'll need to work on that. He needs to work on coming more out and over the ball. Sort of the Tiger Woods move that he's working on now, that sort of over the top move. That you see so many golfers rehearse, Matt Kuchar kind of like. I mean, Rory needs some of that in his golf swing, and and that's what he's missing right now. All right, we'll see if it all plays out going forward at Shinnecock. You're coming up here for the Travelers, right? I will be there. I look forward to seeing you, Trey. All right. uh, and I'll see you somewhere down the road, buddy. You got it, pal. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye. 
This has been the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play Golick and Wingo. Plus, you can check the guys out live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on ESPN News. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So...